2019. Thank you. And they, they did that in a weekend in the garage. Yep. Um, I'm Kirk Thatcher. I'm moderating. That's all you're going to hear about me. Um, next to me is executive producer, Hallie Stanford, president of Jim Henson Television. We have the three co-executive producers and writers, Javier Grillo Markswatch, Will Matthews, and Jeff Addis. We have the two guys responsible for supervising the build and the creation of the characters, Peter Brook, head of the Creature Shop at Jim Henson Company, Toby Froud. And we have two of the performer puppeteers, Alice Deneen and Victor Yared. All right, settle down, quiet down. We got a lot to cover in 25 minutes. <laughs> All that, 10, 10 hours of television. All right, so I'm gonna start with Hallie, yes. who started development of the project with the Jim Henson Company. Hallie, take it away. I will take it away. I do wanna say that 25 years ago, I feel like the whole reason we're all up here is because this guy hired me as his writer's assistant. I just had to do the shout out of And it. I was taking orders from here two weeks later. Yeah, exactly. So um, this is a dream come true to be here, especially up on this panel. It's my son Theo's first Comic-Con, so it's pretty special. Um, but to talk about Dark Crystal, everybody up here is a massive fan of the property. Uh, I grew up with it as a little kid and I loved it, so my job as president of television and executive producer is to make and sell television. But a dream, dream, dream was to create a prequel series of The Dark Crystal. So in doing that, and I went to Lisa Henson and said, we should do this, we should create this series. Where do we begin? Well, it was pretty easy to figure out where to begin. We had the wonderful movie but also Brian Froud had created this book called The World of, Brian, of the Dark Crystal by Brian Froud. And it had all this history of the mystics and the Skeksis and the world. And it just started to spark our imagination. And so Lisa and I decided to put together a giant world building brainstorming session. And we called it The Great Creative Conjunction. And if you don't know what that means, watch the movie. You'll learn all about The uh, uh, Great Conjunction. And so at that session, we brought in Uber fans, we brought in Boom Archaea Comics, we brought in writers, we brought in the Creature Shop, we brought in Brian Froud, which was amazing. And we sat there and we worked on what is this world, what did it look like before the darkening? When, what was it like when there were more than two Gelfling? And we just started to unpack it. And we even like would look at things like the Wall of Destiny, which is something from the original film. And we'd see in it that like in the Wall of Destiny, there was a female Gelfling who was wearing a crown. And we thought, oh my gosh, what if this was a matriarchy and women ran this world? So we're like, yeah, we're gonna do that. And so then we built out the seven clans. We built out the Skeksis. We built out the Mystics. And we felt like we had this very rich, vibrant, prequel thra, and then from that, we dug into developing the television series. And so we were very, very lucky to work with these three to come in and figure out what is that show, how do we make it, and grateful to Netflix for saying, go and make a puppet series of The Dark Crystal. Let's do it like the original. So yeah. very exciting. Um, so I feel like that that's my quick you know, well, I want to the ask, what, in the 25 minutes. To introduce these three guys, yes. what had they worked on that made you go, these are the guys? Um, well, Javier and I had worked uh, when we were, when we were uh, only... Tweens. Tweens, yes, <laughs> tweens. We were really tweens on uh, one of our first projects together um, in the beginning of our careers, uh, a project called the Van Helsing Chronicles. And, um, and so it was... Uh, something that we both felt very strongly about coming back. I'll let him tell about when he first heard about it. I don't want to take that story away from him. But Will and Jeff are such Uber fans, and they came in, and they'll tell their story too, but they came in, coming in hard to pitch a Labyrinth series, but instead we surprised them and said, hey, actually, we're looking to develop a Dark Crystal series. Do you have any ideas? And they certainly did, and this is the show that they created. So, so then you guys all met. Mm -hmm. And they gave you this book of materials they come up with or all the ideas and then you took it from there? Well, I want to go on record as saying these guys did all the heavy lifting. Like I came in after the show had been ordered, so I was really easy because they're so good. I was like, all right, I don't know, let's do that. You know, so my job was actually made quite easy by, by you guys. Maybe you should talk about how you put the show, you know, put, put your concept together. We had been drinking and we came up with an idea for a Labyrinth sequel. And so we called Henson and they said no. And they said, what about Dark Crystal? And we said, heck yes. So we came in to pitch what we thought was a sequel movie. We got it wrong a lot. And they were like, uh, it's a prequel TV show. 
And we said, great, we'll come back in a day or two. And we did, and, that's, and that was the genesis of, of the show. So we get handed a lot of material, a lot of brilliant artwork, a lot of um, development material from other shows. There was they the books tried. by J.M. Lee that there, were I coming mean, out. Comics. I mean, there was just so much material of the 35 years. The scroll. Years. Yeah. And our job was to take all those pieces and build a new whole. And so we had some inherited characters. We had created some new characters. And that was the fun and the challenge of working with such a beloved and long-lived property was finding a new path through this garden. But I remember the d naming Hup upstairs in, our, in my office at home came from us <laughs> my, walking my around. He's fan, like, you know, he's a little fan. guy. He's just like, hey, yo, hey, yo, ho, 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 ho. And that became the name. And Brea was actually, and we've never said this before. Oh, you're going to say it? Is named no, after, don't say it. This is a secret. <laughs> is named after the street that the Henson Studios is on, which is La Brea. Uh, um, we never said that because we were afraid they'd make us change it. Um, do we, do we want to talk about the two pop culture references we snuck into the show? Uh, we'll come back to that. We'll come oh, back to that, okay. All the secrets are coming <laughs> There's out. There's more than two. Yeah, no. uh, uh, yeah and, and so they did all that heavy lifting. They, they wrote an amazing script, and I had just finished ruining The Hundred, and then I had ruined The Shannara Chronicles, and I was trying to ruin Xena, uh, but I, I failed at ruining Xena, apparently, and, uh, and uh, I got a call to come into Jim Henson. The call was literally hey, there's a job at the Jim Henson Company. And I'm like, great, what is it? And they're like, can't tell you. I'm like, why? They're like, top secret Netflix thing. I'm like, all right. So I go to the Jim Henson Company. I walk into a room, and there's Hallie and Lisa Henson and Blanca Lista, who uh, is uh, one of the feature executives at the company. And they literally handed me an NDA before they would tell me what it was. So I signed the NDA, and, and they give me an iPhone with a five-minute concept film that Louis Leterrier had directed to help sell the show to Netflix. And the moment that I realized it was a dark crystal, I, opinions vary. I claim I kept it on the inside. Apparently, I did not. But like, opinions I literally do not vary. Full no. ugly man cry, apparently, in front of Lisa Henson. He did. He cried. Lost innocence, my childhood, all that stuff. And literally, they could have, like, it was literally about, at that point, it was literally about whether the deal would close before they could get the restraining order. <laughs> um, and, uh, and that's how I became part of the show. OK, so then the three of you are tasked with now, was there, was there an arc that you came up with, like you know, main story points? Right, so the main story that the guys had taken from the very beginning and then just blown out was that, let, wh why, why now? Like, why this time now in the prequel of the series? And the why now is, what would be the most interesting time in this, this particular time period? Well, how about when a Gelfling discovers that the Skeksis are bad and that they're draining the Gelfling? And so it started with that of one Gelfling who thinks, how can I possibly motivate a rebellion, a resistance, and does. And so we had Rihanna, our hero, from the beginning. And of course, we had Ogren, all the mystics and the Skeksis. But that's what we had in a world that was darkening, which feels very close to our world. So that's where it began. But from there, the guys took it from there. Well, as, as writers, as being one myself, you're, usually you're given the beginning, the idea, not the ending. So you're given the ending. You know where it ends. <laughs> And you get kind of free reign, except for the characters that are existed to add and create these new characters. What was that process like? It was like, okay, we have this world, this amazing visuals, but we need to fill it with, God, I don't know, well, there's 120 new different characters. Yeah, I think it, there's so. something like 180 characters, creatures in the show. Yeah. Um, we came at it from solving a story problem, right? So each character was a way into the story, whether it was uh, Brea at the top or Deet at the bottom or Rianne in the middle as a company man, that's where it started from. We were trying to ease the audience into a very dense, big, complicated right. world. So it was really about what function can they serve to help the story. And, and we knew from the beginning that the problem of a prequel is that you know the end. And in right. this case, the end can seem a little bleak. It's a bit and sad. So, yeah. we, with the death so we had an Gelfling? answer for that. And yeah. so we went in to pitch Netflix. We pitched them the entire, what we thought would be the entire series, beginning, middle, and end. The end was very important to us to answer this question. Right. And then when they ordered the show and we wrote the pilot and we started moving forward, they said, eh, too much. Cut it in half. So season one ended up being half of our pitch. But the good news is that if all of you watch the show diligently and the metrics are favorable, exactly. uh, whenever they tell us, we already know what happens in season two. It has been developed. It was part of their original pitch. 
So I'm just saying, wow. if you have questions about how it ends and how we can get to that movie, which seems so bleak, but we're we still going to make you happy. To tell Let you. it be on a never-ending loop. Never-ending uh, I mean, Netflix yeah. of Tell Ten Friends. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, Watch the friends. show, write your congressman. It's like the Ogilvy home perm. You tell a friend and they tell a friend. Really, no one under 40 exactly. here? Never mind. Please. <laughs> All right, so now you're in the thick of, you've got the beginning and the half of the middle, and you have to make... 10 episodes, and that was always 10? Was it eight or was always 10? So you kind of divide up the pie into stories, like how you're gonna break it up. And then you jump into all these different characters. And that's a lot of characters, not only writing-wise, but also visually. How much visual input was the creature shot with Toby and his father's work and Pete while you're writing? Because that's one thing the Henson Company does that a lot of companies don't do. They often, here's the writers, now we go hire some artists to kind of design it. I'll just say real quick before I turn it over, it was a lot. They were developing and drawing the whole time that we were writing. So they would talk to each other a lot. We right. would develop off of art, and they would be developing off of our scripts, and so it was very much a collaboration. And that's the DNA of the Dark Crystal, because yeah, exactly. Jim Henson sought out Brian Froud because of these gorgeous drawings, and one in particular that Toby can tell you about, that, um, uh, inspired the look of the Dark Crystal, so it's always hand in hand from the beginning. The creature shop was there from day one. So now we're kind of sliding into creatures and working with the writers. I'm going to try to have this be a very gentle segue. Um, so they're writing these scripts. You're getting stories. You're getting uh, character breakdowns. And how much give and take was there? Like, oh, I just came up with a cool idea for a, a Skaxis or more, I guess, a Gelfling or a Gelfling tribe and you would throw it to them, or how much was Netflix involved? In other words, what was the feedback loop on the designs? Um, was Louis involved? One of the person who's not here, Louis Leterrier, who was producer and directed every episode. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of credit. He's, he was a force of nature unto himself. Yeah, yeah Louis was, uh, was quite incredible to work with, and, and we, did, uh, we did develop a lot of things. I mean, it, it was a very... You know, Give and it take. was a very collaborative kind of a process, quite frankly. You know, um, these guys would do some writing or even just come up with ideas, and um, and then uh, Bri mainly yeah. Brian would uh, do the drawings, right? And then we'd have to translate them back in LA with with Toby. You know, we had a we had a we basically had a, a list and and writes write ups of the Gelfling clans, um, the development the writers had done on. You know what it, what they were like, what they where they existed, how they existed, things like that. And we started on the Gelflings first, I think, because we really wanted to get those seven clans down. You know, visually, what do they look like? So Brian started drawing. I would sculpt maquettes, um, and we'd work with Pete to figure out the look, the feel, and and then translate them into those the physical things you see on screen, um, as the writer, as the writers are trying to make them you know live in this world and go on an amazing adventure. Yeah. Now, were there any creatures that <laughs> you guys designed or any characters, kind of for all five of you, was there anything they wrote you went, I don't even know where to start with that, or was there anything they designed you went, wow, that's crazy, we didn't imagine it that way? Because <laughs> um, I'm, you know, working on the process I have in the years. Yeah, that, lots. That happens a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We always went, what the, all right. Um, no, it was, uh, law was a hard one. Yeah, he law. was a hard one from the beginning when it was yeah. described we didn't quite know what he was meant to be. Yeah. And so Brian did a lot of designs. We went, did a lot of yeah. back and forth. Yeah. We did designs. And yeah. in the end, you know, after a long time, we found, you know, Brian came up with a, with a drawing that Louis and, and Netflix and Henson's everyone sort of really liked. And that's where it sort of took off. I mean, what, one of the difficult things was that we, we were really committed to doing um, almost all of the puppet effects practically. Um, and so that was, a yeah. real, that was a real challenge for us. That's always um, challenging. Yeah. It would have been very easy for us to have just um, said, oh, well, we can't really make that. Let's just do it with computer graphics. But we decided to really adhere to the, um, really to the philosophy of the original movie and make it as practical as possible. And that's why some law is a very good example, actually. We went down a road where... As a practical character, it would have been very difficult to realize. And so we pulled it back closer to Brian's original designs, and it became um, a practical, uh, essentially a Bunraku um, puppet. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 
uh, Javi, you were going to jump in or something? No, no, I'm good. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, guys, yeah. what, so you guys are writing these episodes. They're building these characters. And also, we don't have a production designer here. But the world. I mean, one thing that blew me away, because, and that's where CG did help, was yeah. the worlds that these characters lived in. Yeah. Um, and the production designer was over in England. I, I met him Gavin, once. Gavin Bouquet, Gavin, Gavin Bouquet was, was really quite incredible, actually. And he uh, was involved early on. I remember he was. the sets weren't even built, and he had these amazing CG paintings. Yeah. And again, you were all in this big feedback loop, yeah. which, again, a lot of people, especially in TV series, it's very much like a feature film, but, you know, a 10-hour feature yeah. film. Um, I'll say the amazing thing of, um, you know, building puppets and bringing them to the UK where we shot and then walking onto a uh, Skeksis hallway set. First day that Gavin and the team had built was amazing. Yeah. It was truly an experience. You could walk through the halls. Yeah. You could really walk. I got hall. lost. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you could get lost in those halls, actually. Yeah, we had 79 sets yep. across two football fields. Yes. And all of our, a lot of our shops were there in the facility. So it was very much us for 10 months in these oh, buildings, yeah. in this world, in Thrive. With the biggest grins on our faces. Yeah. Okay, so now we're getting into production and walking the set. So we have two people here yeah. who did that for, what, 11 months? With your right hand up in the air? Yeah. <laughs> these are the two of the main performers, Alice and Victor. And uh, the fact that they can, uh, the fact that their right arm isn't five times bigger than their left arm always amazes me. So tell us who you played to start with, Alice. Uh, I played uh, I played uh, Brea the Gelfling, and also Madra Farah, and the Ornamentalist, and a number of uh, other little tiny creatures um, in cages and stuck to trees and different things. Dark crystal denizens. All right, and Victor, you played a character that has become beloved name, what was it? Hi, Kirky. Hi, Hi Vicky. Uh, you're talking about Hup? Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, there's Hup fans. You double. So, and, and who was the other character? Because then you played a very dark, mean character. I got to do the Ritual Master, which right. was a mean Skeksis. Yes. And I got to do Kylan, who was a sweet Gelfling. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys auditioned for these characters, right? Did they just come in, or did they go, Alice, you're playing so-and-so, or was there a bit of an audition process? Uh, well, we got handed uh, or emailed um, this stack of unbelievable scripts. They were so good. They were so, I mean, just on the page. I just. Don't, you got the job. You can stop auditioning. <laughs> they, they hired you. And, and I, I, I clicked and I opened the first one and I said, what's, what's the girl character going to be like? And, uh, which is sort of the default. You know, I knew I was going to be involved, but I, I, uh, and I started reading them and I thought, oh, oh okay, okay, I, I want to be, I want to be. I want to be Deed. I like this Deed character. Oh, but this Brea character is amazing. Oh, and this Celadon, she's the villain. And like one after another after another, there were these amazing characters. And eventually they, you know, they sorted it out as to who was most suited for which, but and I would have been happy to do any of them. Uh, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was just a, it felt like an embarrassment of riches, not only to read the script, but also to walk onto the set, uh, walk in, see these, this childhood, uh, memory come to life. You could walk into it, you could walk through it, you could get lost in it. And, uh, and then to be handed uh, these beautiful, beautiful physical creations, these puppets that we got to work with. It was just an incredible privilege. All right, speaking of puppets you got to work with, Victor, I, I've told you brought a friend. Yeah, you want to see Kirky? Yeah, I'd like to see that. <laughs> so this is the actual puppet. From Dark Crystal, Age of Resistance. It, it might take me 10 or so minutes to get it on. No, that's good. They'll, we'll be walking off the stage at that point. <laughs> we'll they're they they're cutting easy. us short for some reason. But <laughs> I think this will... Come see backstage in 10 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, meet... Ha! Yay! Okay. Yay! Woo! Doza! Doza mean hello, Kirk. <laughs> that's, that's, I don't speak podling. Why, why, why not, Kirk? Because uh, I didn't work on the show. I didn't learn it. Kirk, you want to learn podling? I, I, I would be great, yeah. Okay, I'll teach you. I'll okay. teach you. Okay. Um, you can count, okay? I can. One, two, three. One, two, three. Eight, day, tray. Eight, day, tray. Four, five, six. Four, five, six. O, do, tro. O, do, tro. No, her, help me make a mistake. E, D, tree. E, D, tree. <laughs> A day tray, E D tree. Oh, oh, don't trust seven, eight, nine. Sorry. That's, okay, you know what? Hop, hop, podling a little rusty. You were not there. a mathematician, I'm imagining. So, actually, I have a question about the podling language. As the writers, did you write some phonetic 
or did somebody come up with the language? Or? J. J. Lee. J. M. Lee has a master's in linguistics. But then, but then Victor would send emails in Podlink. Victor learned the whole language <laughs> so well. He would send emails to, to, to J. M. Lee. He would be like, I don't know what you're saying. Victor memorized like the entire Podlink dictionary. It was amazing. Yeah, well, it's tough. You know, you learn a language, you have to practice it, and there's nobody that speaks Podlink <laughs> except Joe and maybe Jeff a little, so... I was, just try, I was just trying to learn. I only know yeah. the swear words. I remembered those. You'll see but them peppered throughout the show. We are hoping that Podling will overtake Klingon as the most widely spoken artificial language. So it. please, yeah. join Klingon us. Klingon has had it too easy, I'll That's say. right. <laughs> all they have to fight against with Esperanto. Podling, come on, guys. <laughs> all right, well, we, they're, they're gesturing us for us to get Kirk, out. Kirk, let's rile stage. up crowd. <laughs> when I say dark, you say crystal. Dark. <laughs> dark. When I say second, you say season. Second. <laughs> second. Speak, that's a great segue to last question. Everyone asked, will there be a second season? And Hallie said she would answer that question. Keep watching. Netflix has told us they'll crunch the data. They're going to take a look at how everybody's looking at it. So hopefully we'll get one. And you guys keep watching. Tell your friends. Thank you, LA Comic Con. Hallie Stanford, Javier Grillo, Mark Swatch. Will Matthews, Jeff Addis, Pete Brook, Toby Frown, <laughs> signs, Kirk, Alice signs. Dean, and Hup. Hup. Yay. Yay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I thought they were going to give us 25 minutes.